How's everybody doing today? Great. Um, I want to pray in a moment. I just want to share with you, if I can, quickly uh, an image that uh, the Lord gave to myself and uh, two of my teammates who are here with me, uh, Steve and Mary, as we were praying this morning. How many people had a chance to go to Mass this morning? Uh, those of you who didn't get to Mass, how many of you had a chance to read the Gospel this morning? So for those of you who don't know either one of those things, uh, let me just remind you quickly. So the gospel this morning is the, the feeding of the 4,000 uh, with uh, seven loaves of bread and a few fish. So Jesus is always is uh, provoked by and stirred up by the situation of the people who are around him. So he translated into English rather weakly as something like he was moved with compassion, which is not what it really says. It's more like his, his guts are turned inside out as he sees the situation of the people. And he says to the apostles, um, I don't want to send them back home. we got to feed them. They say, uh, not a chance. We don't have enough food, kind of like here. Although it sounds like we do. <laughs> Unless you want a salad. <laughs> and then um, he says, how many loaves of bread you got? They have seven. And so he does what he always does, right? He prays, he breaks the bread, and then he gives them to the disciples. And he says to them, distribute food. And so I feel like that's what the Lord wants to do this morning and this afternoon with us. Uh, we ourselves, certainly me, uh, I have nothing to offer anybody or to feed anybody with, uh, but God has an abundance. And even this morning as we were celebrating Mass, uh, where we're staying, just felt like the Lord was putting into our hands uh, the food that He wants to give to us. And that his desire is that you and I would all leave here having eaten and feeling satisfied. So may that happen, all right? So mindful of that, let's, let's pray, shall we? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good and gracious Father, we want to thank you for the wondrous gift of life. The blessing of this day. For the opportunity to reflect leisurely at length and here in the presence of your Son, hidden behind the appearance of bread, on all that you have done for us. Father, we thank you for creating us to be alive at this moment in the church and in our country, in this place. We thank you for the gifts that you've so generously poured into every person here in this church. Lord, I pray for those here who do not yet know what it is that your Son has accomplished. That this day they might be overwhelmed by your love, your kindness, your power, your goodness. And that you would send us all forth from this place, eager to rescue others around us who are today as we once were, And so, Father, we thank you in advance for all you're going to do. We ask your spirit to be uh, in my mouth, in our ears, in our hearts, that we would hear only those things that you wish us to hear. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All right. So um, let me just say something quick, if I can, about uh, the work that I do now. So if I can just ask Steve and Mary, if you guys would stand real quick. So um, Deacon Steve Mitchell, he's the tall one, and then uh, Mary Guilfoyle. Uh, so Steve, Mary, myself, there's two other members. Um, we make up this team called Acts 29. So I, I just want to give you a context of what we do. So uh, this isn't what we do, although we're honored to be here, trust me. Um, so I've, uh, I'm a priest of 23 years. of a pastor uh, the last 15. And about a year and a half ago or so, I approached our archbishop in Detroit and just asked him if he would be open to considering my doing something different after uh, that assignment came to a conclusion, and he said, um, yeah, let's pray about that. So he allowed me to do that with my spiritual director. And then through a, a variety of different situations, conversations and whatnot, we landed on creating this. So Acts 29, how many people know what happens in the 29th chapter of Acts? <laughs> Say nothing, right? <laughs> There's 28 chapters in Acts, right? So the whole, the whole point of this, and I wish I could say that I came up with it, but I didn't. Um, you, you and I are living the 29th chapter of Acts. That's the point. 
Or better yet, the Holy Spirit is writing through you and me right now. The 29th chapter of Acts. The same Spirit who was moving in the lives of Paul and Timothy and Titus and Peter is wanting to move through you and me to do now in our age what he was doing in their age. This is our time. That was their time. This is our time. We we passionately believe that uh, you and I were born for this moment. God could have created you to be alive at any moment in history, but he didn't. He chose you to be alive right now with everything that's happening in the church and in the world. And he has equipped you with all the gifts, supernatural and natural, that you have. And his desire is that you would let him pick you up and use you as an instrument in his hands to accomplish his desire. And his desire is what's at the top of that screen. He wants his world back. He could do that in any way he wanted. For some reason, he chooses to work through broken people like me and like you. Our task is, once we've encountered the Lord and been overwhelmed by him, to then understand that there's nothing more worth doing with our lives than to be agents of rescue. Or as C.S. Lewis put it in Mere Christianity, instruments of sabotage, which is an expression I love. I'll get to that later. So anyway, we created this. So we're a nonprofit. We travel all around the country. Um, Our work is primarily to pour into priests. My experience over the last um, 15 years, especially as a pastor, and uh, then my experience of just working with my brothers all around the country is no matter what the facades look like on the outside of our faces, um, the priesthood right now is um, desperately in need of revival. And I don't mean that because they're a problem. I mean that because the situation of parish life is broken. How many priests are here in this parish? Three priests? How many parishers? Parishers? How many families in this parish? 2,600. Okay, so 2,600 families, so maybe like 10,000 people, 8 to 10,000 people, three priests. Not happening. I was a pastor of 3,600 families. I had three priests, two other guys with me, 12,000 people. You can't care for 12,000 people. It's just not possible. And there's a lot of resources here, obviously, and presumably a great staff and team that work with those three priests, but it's still not possible. Parish life has got to radically change if people are going to get cared for in the way that God wants them to get cared for. Because St. Michael's, or wherever you're from, doesn't exist simply for the sake of those people who come here, right? The Catholic Church, to my knowledge, is the only organization that exists for the sake of those that don't belong to it. Right? Father Brian, who's the pastor here, he's responsible for, together with, if there's other pastors in this area, every single person, not every Catholic, every single person who lives in this territory until you get to the boundary of the next parish. That's not doable in the way that we're set up right now. So because of what we've seen, God has called us in a particular way to first pour into pastors around the country, to work with them, to help them, really to just love them, rejuvenate them. Because at least in my own experience, I realized I took the month of July off uh, before I started uh, this new work with Steve and Mary and uh, Chris and Nick. In the third week of July, I woke up one day and I realized, I think I'm in PTSD and I mean it. Because parish life, you go from trauma to trauma to trauma to trauma to trauma. Your head's on a swivel all day long. We just play whack-a-mole. And you live in the middle of that all the time. Nobody calls a priest and says, hey, I'd like to come by and spend a half hour just telling you how good my life is. We don't get those people. We just get crisis after crisis after crisis after crisis. And so do the laymen and women who work with us. And it's a great gift and it's an honor. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's just that the way we're set up right now is not the way I think God intends it to be. So it's a great honor and joy for us to go around the country and to pour into priests. So we've, 
We typically do retreats for priests around the country. We do them as a diocesan convocation. So a bishop contacts us, we go to a diocese, and we bring all the priests on retreat and just try to pour into them and love them. We've had a chance to be in front of about 15, uh, 550 priests over the last six months and have just been beyond grateful for the opportunity to share with them what we feel like God has shared with us. Don't get me wrong. We don't think we have the answer. Nobody has the answer. God has the answer. We just want to be agents of revival and transformation as best we can. So that's our work. At the heart of our work, really, is telling the story. So that's really what I'm here to do today. I want to be a storyteller. I'm not sure why it says Romans 1.16 there. If you open up your Bible, that's not what you're going to find in Romans 1.16. But I love technology. It never always works. But, um, so forget the quote, always the citation. A friend of mine, uh, a woman who I've come to greatly respect uh, tremendously over the last number of years, said this recently. In the final analysis, theological speculation can only take us so far. We need to know the story. I'm here to proclaim the story, the story, the one story, the only story that changes lives. And it's so easy right now with all that's going on in the church, whether it's internationally or nationally, or all that's going on in the country, to get lost in the weeds, if you will. I would argue there's never been a more important time for us to back up and to recapture the big picture. And to try to understand what God's plan is for the world and then for you and I who are living in it right now. So the, throughout the course of the day, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to try to lead us through, it's really three talks and then an opportunity for us to respond before the Lord in the Eucharist. Okay, so that's where we're going to go today. It's intended to be a retreat, not a talk. And hopefully that'll become clear as we walk our way through, huh? So here's our title. Recapturing the big picture of God's plan for the world and our mission in it. There's the Romans 116 quote, right? So, so Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. The word he uses there for power, that's the Greek word from which we get the word dynamite. In other words, the gospel is not news. The gospel is extraordinary news. It's life-changing news. It's the only life-changing news. I'm thrilled the Chiefs won the Super Bowl. I would have been happier if the Lions won the Super Bowl. But the closest Detroit can get to winning the Super Bowl is the Tigers drafted Patrick Mahomes. And we will probably never get closer to the Super Bowl again. But that won't change your life. Like the moment you win, it's like, man, who did we lose this year? Who are we going to sign? What are we going to do next year? It's an amazing rush. I love sports for those reasons. But then what? Like I got to keep winning. Right? The gospel is not like that. The gospel is amazing, extraordinary, life-changing news. My problem is I don't think most people have ever experienced it that way. At least not most Catholics. So when Paul says the gospel, he doesn't mean Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There isn't a Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John when Paul's preaching. That comes after Paul. He means the story, what we're going to try to unpack here today. And note this right away. This is really important for those of us, which is all of us, who are called to be heralds of the gospel. The power is not in the proclaimer. In other words, it doesn't have anything to do with me or my gifting. The power is in the message itself. Catch that? All we have to do is to share it. You don't have to worry about trying to convince people. You just have to share it. And so what I want to try to do is to equip us as best we can to leave here able to share it. And I feel like I'm 54, I'm 23 years ordained. I feel like I've learned how to share this better over the last two years than I ever have in my life. That's why this is my one passion right now, is just to continue to be 
a storyteller, if you will. Pope Francis, in uh, the letter he wrote, The Joy of the Gospel, in speaking about the gospel, small g, huh? this thing which is power for salvation, says it's the message that's capable of responding to the desire for the infinite which abides in every human heart. And oh, by the way, nothing else can. You and I were made with this insatiable desire to know that we matter, that life has meaning for love, for an understanding of what this is all about. Only the gospel can answer that desire. Pope John Paul II, in a letter that he wrote on the importance of teaching the faith, he says this, that the result of the proclamation of the gospel, which I'll unpack for us here in a moment, is supposed to be this, that a person is one day overwhelmed and brought to the decision to surrender themselves or entrust themselves to Jesus in faith. Now, St. Mike's might be the most extraordinary parish in the country. But here's my bet. If I was up here tonight at Mass or tomorrow morning at Mass, and I just asked for a show of hands in this parish, and I said, how many people here have been overwhelmed by the gospel? Don't raise your hands right now. It's an exercise in your imagination. How many hands do you think would go up? I don't think very many. It's not because of the preaching here. That's not my point. Then I ask a follow-up question. How many people here have made a decision to surrender their lives, their lives, to Jesus in faith? How many hands do you think would go up? Like one to fewer, right? Not us who've come out on a, on a Saturday morning who've decided to give a day to the Lord, but I'm talking about the typical person who comes to church on a Sunday. I don't think most Catholics have ever been overwhelmed by the gospel, and I don't think most Catholics have surrendered themselves to Jesus in faith. And they'd say, of course I haven't, I'm Catholic. <laughs> Why would I do that? All right? My desire, my prayer, our prayer, Steve and Mary's and mine, is that God will this day again, starting with me, overwhelm us with what he's done to the point that we make again a decision to surrender ourselves to Jesus in faith. Because I have to make that day after day after day. And the challenge of being a priest, quite frankly, is it's dangerous because you get used to the magnificent. Fulton Sheen used to say to priests all the time, brothers, don't ever get used to handling the body of Christ. But that's not just in the Eucharist, that's also in his word. We do this for a living. We don't make any money, but we do this for a living. And it's easy to become accustomed to speaking about these things and no longer be moved. I was at a, a conference back in uh, January not too long ago, and there was a, a, a layman who was teaching priests. They were all priests who were at the conference, and he was teaching. He himself is a convert. He was a former minister. And at one point as he's teaching, he just kind of looked away, and he started to cry as he was teaching. And there were these two priests sitting in front of us, and they both kind of looked at each other like, What's up with that? And then they both looked at each other and went, oh, shoot, like, when's the last time I cried preaching or teaching the faith? We need to be overwhelmed by the gospel. So the most powerful way that God has helped me to speak about the gospel is to use an image, and the image is D-Day. Anybody here in high school? Okay, one over there. Great, praying for you. So ma imagine this is a high school history exam. Here's the picture, and, and we had a little multiple choice quiz. You know, like, so why are they there? It's June 6, 1944. Why are they there? Option A in the quiz. The coffee on Champs-Élysées in Paris. 
is just like the best, right? Like no one's circling that, right? Option B, the beaches in France are second to none, right? Like no one's answering that. Option C, you have got to see the Mona Lisa. No, right? It's a no-brainer. Why are they there? They're there to fight. They're there because a continent has been taken over by a demonic dictator whose desire is to enslave the people. Here's the problem. I put that picture up, this sweet little saccharine picture, and I ask you, what's he doing there? I don't think we know. Not in the same way that we know the answer to the previous picture. The answer is the same. He's there to fight. God didn't become a man to tell stories, although he told them. And he didn't become a man to do miracles, although he did them. God became a man to rescue his creation. And when we know that, and we experience it, you live to tell everybody because that's the answer to life. Imagine Deacon Steve and I are living in France. It's June 7th, 1944. Our parents have been killed by the Nazis. Family members have been imprisoned. Our country's overrun by a dictator. There is no hope. There is no help coming. This is our life now. It has been since 1941. And we're sitting there having a cup of coffee. It's bad coffee because it's the war. And as I'm sitting there, the paper boy tosses in a paper, and I open up the paper, and I open up to this. And I'm sitting there reading it, and Steve looks at me, and he goes, so what happened yesterday? And I go, well, not much. Allies landed. Hmm. Looks like it might rain today. You think I'd read it that way? Not a chance, right? This isn't news. Not for the people of France, not for the people of Europe, not on June 7th, 1944. That's not news. It's extraordinary news. It changed everything for them. Someone's come for us. Someone's come to rescue us. Somebody cares. Somebody's come to fight. Freedom is an actual possibility for us now. Someone's come to do something about this wacko in Berlin. The gospel's better than that. Infinitely better than that. Every time, every time now, that somebody comes to talk to me about something, I have found that it's essential for me to say, um, before I answer what it is you've come to talk to me about, can I explain to you quickly how I see the world? So one of the ways of trying to understand what I'm trying to do with us today is I want to try to offer what I would call a, a, a biblical set of lenses, how to see reality. So a woman came to see me about year and a half ago now, she was in her mid-20s. She was drop-dead beautiful. She was extremely successful professionally. Internally, her life was a total train wreck. And so she called. She asked if she could come by and see me. I said, sure. She came by. She started talking to me about what was going on in her life. I said, what would you like from me? She says, I want to know what to do. I said, before I answer that, can I just tell you how I see the world? Because if I don't explain that to you, nothing I'm about to say is going to make any sense. She said, yeah. So I shared with her in about five minutes, which you're going to have to endure over the course of the day. <laughs> and when I got done, she looked at me. She's bawling her eyes out, and she said this. That's not the God I knew growing up. I've never heard this. Why have I never heard this? Here's the challenge, I think, if I can speak candidly as a Catholic priest. The reason why most people never hear this is because of our lectionary. Right, you come to Mass at Sunday, 
and you hear from a lectionary, the challenge for a priest, right, the most important thing in public speaking is, who's my audience? Right? Like, who am I talking to? Oh, it was good to know this was the Rotary Club. <laughs> I thought this was halftime at the Super Bowl. Wow. It helps to know who I'm talking to. I would argue, I can see some of my brothers out here, there is no more diverse audience than the congregation in a Catholic church on any given Sunday, right? Because half the people don't want to be there. It's a miracle they're there. I mean, it's amazing, right? I think Jeff Caven says, you want to see the real, real miracle on Sunday? People are there. They don't believe in the real presence, at least not according to the statistics. They don't know the Bible. They haven't surrendered their lives to Jesus. And they're there. It's like amazing, right? Like, why have they come? I don't know, but I'm thrilled, right? So you got some people there who, who are in love with the Lord, who have surrendered to Jesus, who are, who are all in, right? And they want meat. But they're sitting next to somebody else who's like, man, when are we going to get out of here? What time's the game? What do I got to do today? They don't want meat. They don't even know what they want. And so the, the priest or the deacon, whoever's preaching, he's trying to both multiply disciples and evangelize all at the same time. It's an amazingly difficult thing to do. And because of our lectionary, the lectionary presupposes you know the Bible. How many people in a typical Sunday Mass know the Bible? Almost nobody, right? So you get this reading about a guy who walks up to another guy who's plowing his field, and he throws his coat over the guy, and the guy responds by going, what are you doing? And then that guy like slaughters the oxen he was plowing with, and then he burns the utensils he was using, and then they go off and they start doing some ministry. It's like, what in the world does this have to do with my life? And so you're hoping Father Brian up there is just not talking too long, he's kind of funny, and he's got a point. <laughs> like, that's not what the Word of God's supposed to be reduced to. And so I would argue, I feel like God said this to me over and over again, every parish, at least once a year, at least once a year, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying like go rogue and don't read the lectionary, just don't preach on it for like four weeks in a row. Why? Because people need to know the story. Until I know the story, nothing else will make sense. Anybody here teach high school? A few people? Yeah. Usually, certainly with freshmen anyway, usually the beginning of the year, what do you do? You do review. We never do review in the church, or we rarely do review in the church. And God's just impressed on me over and over again how essential it is, whether it's the beginning of Lent or the whole season of Lent, beginning of the new year, maybe it's in September, take four or five weeks and all you do is you just tell the story. You preach the gospel. I think this is what many of our Protestant brothers and sisters do very well. It's not uncommon, at least in Michigan, to hear people say things like, I grew up Catholic and then I went to... Kensington Community Church, and I met Jesus. Now, objectively speaking, they're dead wrong. Because you can't meet Jesus anywhere like you can meet him in the Eucharist. They didn't know that, though. And so I believe them when they say that, because what they're saying, in essence, is, I grew up Catholic, I really didn't know what it was about, and then someone preached the gospel to me, and I got it. Now, oftentimes those churches, often, not always, but oftentimes they don't do a whole lot after that. But they do that really well. And we have everything to offer. But it doesn't make sense until you've grasped the story. So what's the story? The story is what's technically called the kerygma. So this isn't exactly a word that just rolls off our tongues, right? It's a Greek word. It means proclamation. The one who proclaims the kerygma is a carex, a herald. That's what I want to be. That's what we're all called to be, heralds of the kerygma, all right? The kerygma is typically broken up into four parts. The goodness of creation, sin and its consequences, God's response to our sin, and our response to what God has done for us. This is what we're going to walk through today. The result of this, again, John Paul says, keep this constantly in your minds, please, is supposed to be 
that a person is overwhelmed and brought to a decision to surrender in faith. To be able to say to God, you, after I've considered all that you have done for me, can have everything. Now use me to help others come to know this. So the goodness of creation, sin and its consequences, God's response to our sin and our response to what God has done for us. That's a mouthful. So it's hard to remember all this. So we need ways to to keep in our mind how to tell the story, right? Here's one way to do it. Ask four questions. They're all huge questions. The first question having to do with the goodness of creation is this. Why is there something rather than nothing? Mary and I were uh, working in Des Moines uh, a couple of months ago. We were doing it at a high school. There's one Catholic high school in all of Des Moines. Did you know that? Dowling Catholic High School. It's the only high school and only Catholic high school in the diocese. So we did, a, we did this for the high school students. And after the end of the first talk, this young guy came up to me. I think he was a sophomore. And he just says, Father, I didn't hear a thing you said after you asked that question. I can't stop thinking about that question. That's a huge question. Why is there something rather than nothing? Science can't give you the answer to that. Like, why do you exist? Why are there planets? Why is there a universe? Why is there anything? Second question, why is everything so obviously messed up? Because it is. Maybe you've noticed. What, if anything, has God done about it? And if he's done anything about it, how come it still looks so messed up? And then lastly, how is it that we should respond to this? That's still a mouthful. So I was out in, uh, in Denver back in the, a year ago in the fall, maybe. It was the first time that I felt like the Lord had, had led me to begin to try to teach this to people. And so there was a gentleman there who was uh, at the talk that I was given and uh, who I respect greatly. I asked him afterwards, I would love your feedback on this. Like, was this good? Was this helpful? Was this useful? And he said two things to me. He said, John, I think this is the best talk in the gospel I've ever heard in my life, but it's not repeatable. I went, that's constructive feedback. And so I prayed for months with his words in my mind. Lord, help me to find a way to make this repeatable. Here's how I make it repeatable. It's four words. Created, captured, rescued, and response. If you know those four words, you know the gospel. Created, captured, rescued, and response. For each of these four words, the way I try to pray with these and the way I try to encourage other people to go through them is for each word, you ask for a very specific grace. St. Ignatius, the founder of the Jesuits, would always encourage us when we pray, go and ask God for a particular grace when you enter into prayer. Don't just, don't just start praying Ask for something. So for each of these, there's a grace. The grace for created is, I want to grow in wonder and in trust. The grace for captured, as odd as it sounds, is despair. The grace for rescued is unshakable confidence. And the grace for response is gratitude, surrender, and courage. So let's do this right now. We'll do this and then we'll take a break. Join me. I just want to ask God to give us this grace, okay? So let's just pray. Father, we ask right now that as we look at the grandeur of the universe that you have made, and most especially the creature that you love the most in it, that you would increase within all of us, but most especially those of us who need it the most this morning, wonder and trust in you who are a good father. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So there's two things to highlight in going through this first word or the first part of the story, which is power, right? Which can change lives because it's extraordinary news, not ordinary news. 
So one thing to get clear on is the absolute uniqueness of the accounts of creation in Scripture. And then the second is, I just want to look at one verse in particular with you, which for me has become um, a really powerful verse to pray with, Genesis 1.16. So first, the uniqueness of the accounts of creation in Genesis 1 and 2. So I I went to the University of Michigan. I'm a liberal arts major. My degree is in English and communications, which means I had a lot of fun in school. All right? So... Those of you who are engineers, those are servile arts, <laughs> all right? Those things are, are means to an end. Liberal arts are things that you just do for their own sake. So I had a lot of fun. All my friends who were in engineering school, they hated school, but now they're making a lot of money, so that's good for them. Anyway, because I was doing liberal arts, I had a lot of time to take classes that nobody had any use for, like mythology. So one of the things, I remember this one woman, she was teaching Greek mythology, She tried to make the argument that every culture has a creation myth, which is true, and they're all more or less the same, which is dead false. There's nothing like the stories of creation that we find in Genesis 1 and 2 in what are called the ancient Near Eastern myths, the myths of creation and the neighbors of Israel. Nothing. In those cultures... Their stories of creation, their worldview, okay? So the worldview is the lenses through which I see reality and the things which motivate my decisions. Everybody in here has a worldview, even if you don't know it. It's what determines what you choose to do and not do, what you spend your time with, what you spend your money on, what you live for. Everybody's got a worldview, right? The ancient Near Eastern worldview looks something like this. There are many gods, and none of them are any good. They're they're actually a lot like us. They're lustful, they're warring, they're capricious, they're jealous, they're envious. They're not even really in charge. They're underneath what are called the fates, which are other beings which are greater than them. And at a certain point in the universe, these gods chose to make man, just the male, for one purpose, to be their slave, so that they could just have more fun. And then they make woman for one purpose children, or pleasure. So in a world like that, there's no meaning to anything. There's no meaning to life. There's no meaning to marriage. There's no meaning to sexuality. There's no meaning to family. There's no meaning to work. There's no meaning. And in a culture like that, where there is no meaning, the prevailing mood is despair. There is no point to living. Therefore, what do you do? You maximize pleasure and you minimize pain. What else would you live for? He who dies with the most toys wins. That's our culture. Into that worldview, God brought the revelation that is Genesis 1 and 2, which is strikingly different. And God reveals to us, no, there's actually only one me, and he's really good. And everything he made, he made out of love, not out of need. God doesn't need me. He doesn't need creation. He's perfectly happy. He's not waiting for the next toy to come out. And everything he made, he made effortlessly. He just breathes things into existence. He just speaks and things come into existence. And the highlight of everything that he made is the human person, who's not made to be a slave. He's made out of love, and he's made for friendship, and he's made in his image and his likeness. And he exists male and female, and he's made for communion with God and with each other. And the end of every single human person is to be divinized. You were made. I was made. Every person you'll ever meet was made. The person, the homeless guy in the corner, the person on the porn website, the woman who's in hospice care, every person you and I will ever see is destined to be divinized, to share in God's own divine nature. That's why there's no unimportant people. Remember where you were on 9-11? I was in an airport. I was in Chicago. 
about to get on a plane to fly to Minneapolis to go with a priest friend of mine to do some talks. Standing in line, there's a little monitor on the corner next to the gate. And as I'm looking at the monitor about to get on the plane, it looks like a plane just flew into the World Trade Center. And sheer pandemonium breaks out in the airport in Chicago. Everybody's evacuated out of the building. They put us onto buses. I was on a bus with a bunch of uh, flight attendants. They brought us over to a hotel. They just dumped us in the lobby. I waited for my friend to drive down from Wisconsin. I'm sitting there waiting in the lobby for hour after hour after hour. And I'm watching one of the talking heads on one of the major news networks talk about everything that's happening. And for those of us who are alive at that moment, you'll never forget where you were watching the towers come down. And I remember there was a, the, the news anchor. He's standing there on the screen or seated at his desk. And somebody hands him something from off screen. And he looks at it. And he looks very perplexed and kind of saddened. And then he looks back at the TV audience and he says, I just learned that those flights fly back and forth from Boston to LA. And then he looks straight at the TV and he says, I bet there were some important people on those planes. Wow. Some important people. I mean, people like you, people on TV, actors, politicians, athletes, the other people, the teachers, the stay at home dads, the moms, they're not important. The audacity of some idiot to say something like that. There are no unimportant people. Every person is destined to be divinized and to share in God's own life forever. If you were to see, C.S. Lewis once said, the person sitting next to you right now in the pew, as they will be in heaven, you would be tempted to fall down and to worship them. That's what we will look like when we are basking in God's glory. But let me just do this and then we'll take a break. Let me zero in on one passage if I can. So Genesis 1.16 says, oh, by the way, right? So you know Genesis 1 and 2, you don't read them literally. Genesis just throws people for a loop. So the Bible's a library. It's, not a, it's, it's filled with lots of different genres. The challenge for those who don't know scripture is, what genre am I reading? I mean, you got poetry, you got love songs, you got historical narrative, you got psalms, you got apocalyptic literature. You got all these different things. And, and it's kind of like reading a newspaper, except when you and I read the newspaper, we've learned how to read the newspaper, right? Editorials, this is not true. Weather, this is not true. Um, <laughs> right? We just know these things, right? When we read the scripture, it's like, oh, what do I do with this? Is this literal? Is it not literal? And the whole Bible's not literal. Many parts of the Bible are literal. Don't get me wrong. Like this whole idea about God coming back from the dead, very literal. But not everything's literal. In Genesis 1 and 2 are two stories of creation. They're different. They're in back-to-back -back chapters. And that's kind of like God's way of saying, dum-dum, don't read this literally. Try to understand the truths that I'm revealing. Right? So the best way to understand Genesis 1 to 11 is they're like inspired poetry, which again, if you're an engineer, it makes your head explode. So sorry about that. If you're an English and communications major, you love it. <laughs> so poetry is a way of speaking to the whole person. Myth, we think, means not true. That's not what myth means. Myth is the language that was used by every culture up until about 150 years ago to try to make sense out of things which mere historical data can't capture. One of the ways you know that Genesis 1 and 2 are not to be made literally is that on the fourth day, God creates the sun. How do you get a day without a sun? Right? So God made the two great lights. The greater light to rule the day, that would be the 
Good. That would be the sun. The lesser light to rule the night, that would be the, very good, the moon. Some of you didn't seem so sure about that. And then, I don't know how, you know, whoever's writing Genesis for the first time, putting it, you know, to paper or whatever he's writing on, animal skin, he's got some instrument in his hands. So I picture this guy or whoever it is, he's sitting there going, oh, he made the sun, he made the moon. Oh, yeah, forgot to tell you. He made the stars, too. He made the stars, too? Are you kidding me? Do you know how many stars there are? This is just thrown in there like a toss-away line? See that picture? Those aren't stars. These are galaxies. Every one of them. The universe is, at least it was this morning, 46 billion light years across. That's 46 billion times 5.88 trillion miles across. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention. He made those things too. <laughs> there are somewhere around 100 billion, some would say maybe a trillion galaxies in the universe. Each galaxy, each one of those little things, has roughly 100 billion stars in them. Now, look at God's creation. These are all from the Hubble Space Telescope. These aren't some science fiction artist's depictions of what reality might look like. These are pictures of what the God who made you in his image and likeness can do. He didn't make that. <laughs> but that's the best way I know how to explain the universe. So I heard a guy talking one time, he was at a men's conference, he was a high energy particle astrophysicist. I have no idea what that even means. But he was trying to explain to people how big the universe is. And so he says, so you know, how do you picture 46 billion times 5.88 trillion miles, especially if you're an English major? So he says, so let me give you an image to try to grasp how big the universe is. The universe, imagine building a sandcastle where every single star is a grain of sand. How big would the castle be? Five miles high, five miles wide, and five miles long. That's how big the castle would be. Where every single Star is a grain of sand. There are 10 times more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on the world's deserts and beaches. There are in the universe 70 sextillion stars. That's this number. Remember that number. We'll come back to that in a moment. There's a quiz. Here's another way to grasp the size of the universe and to try to ask God to help us grow in wonder and in trust. So our sun, obviously a star, right? It's actually a small star. You can fit roughly a million Earths, so about a million of these go into that. The largest star that we found up until two years ago is this star, which has the English translation of the name Big Dog, which is kind of a cool name for a star, right? So inside the Big Dog, you can fit, get a load of this, seven quadrillion Earths. What's a quadrillion? Remember Bill Cosby, right? What's an arc? So imagine we do a little exercise and try to learn numbers. So I'm going to ask Tim here to count to a million. We're going to see Tim in 11 and a half days. 
Beth's going to count to a billion. And it's going to be some time until we see you. You're going to come back in 31 years. Right? Patsy's going to count to a trillion. We're not going to see you again. That's going to take you 31,000 years. And I'm going to count to a quadrillion. And it will take me 31 million years to count to a quadrillion. You can fit seven quadrillion Earths inside one star. And God just breathed it into being without any effort. Remember that number? So it's going to take me 31 million years to count to a quadrillion. You want to know how many years it's going to take me to count to a sextillion? You'll have to count to a quadrillion, which is 31 million years, 10 million times. That's how many stars are in the universe. Why is that so important? Because God knows every one of them by name. That's what scripture tells us. He counts the number of the stars. He calls them all by name. Lift up your eyes on high. Who created all these? He leads forth the starry host by number and he calls each one by name. And in this universe, which is 46 billion light years across, filled with 70 sextillion stars, there's one creature he loves the most. And it's you. Not y'all. Just you. This God who made all of this without any effort, out of love, holds right now your life in his hands. And he's not anxious. And he has no rival. And I don't know about you, but when I go to pray, I try to picture God, who I'm talking to. Maybe you do the same. Whatever your image of God is, it's wrong. God is massive beyond all comprehension. Don't raise your hand right now. Let me just ask you, anybody in here anxious about anything? The point of looking on all of this to start with is to shatter anxiety. Whatever you're worried about, God can handle a loved one who's away from the faith, family member who's battling cancer, concerns about our job, whatever it is that's going on in your life, God can handle it. That doesn't mean everything's going to be easy. That's not my point at all. But as we're going to see as we go out throughout the day, this God who is not just all powerful, but good in a way we could never imagine, he's the one who is weaving history. It is, after all, his story. And so right now, we just want to thank him for the fact that our lives are in his hands, and he's more than able to provide for us. So cast all your anxiety upon him, Peter says, like right now, because he cares for you. Keep these lingering in your mind before we come back together. How's contemplating the grandeur of the universe impacting you right now? In your experience, how many Catholics have been overwhelmed by the message of the gospel and brought to a decision to surrender to Jesus? Maybe this part of the country is absolutely unique. But I'll bet it's not. And lastly, what's causing you anxiety right now? Like, name those things. 
It's really important to do that. Name them, write them down, capture them. And then bring them to the one who made the universe. And look at his grandeur and his power. And remember, you don't have to be anxious. All right, let's take a break.